So today I'm going to talk about spirit attachments and dark energy. Um, this was a request that somebody made on my channel and I have made another video about a perspective about entities, so to speak. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about this, maybe just to relax people's minds, um, to have just an understanding of the way that energy works. Um, I do shamanic work with people and I have traversed some pretty interesting uh, psychic landscapes, let's put it that way, in myself and in my clients. And I have seen a number of these so-called dark energies and I've explained a few of those stories which I might recount here. Um, but the bottom line with all of that and the most important thing to understand is, well, it's really a few things. One is that we want to understand the part of our minds that invite in, right, these so-called dark energies. Um, so for example, a very common uh, personality trait that would attract dark energy into your life is a strong desire for power, power over others, or basically anything that your ego defines as power that is other than unconditional love, because the only true power in the universe is unconditional love. Anything other than that, right, any other ways that we attempt to manipulate reality or to feel superior or even inferior are cheap substitutes, right, for the real deal, which is unconditional love. So <clears throat> the desire for power, right, because if you think of reality as having levels of energy and if they are represented by the human emotions, the bottom of this, of the energy table, you could say, would be reflected as apathy. So let's say you're in apathy and, right, you basically don't care about anything, you don't um, feel like there's a reason to live. Well, there are beings on that level of energy that will feed on that perspective on those emotions, specifically the emotional energy. And besides feeding on emotional energy, we invite shady characters into our temple for the clear fact that we are not in our temple, right? So if we're disassociated, if we are feeling apathetic and checked out and numb, right, in, in the power of now, there's a very powerful line that says, when the master is not home, all sorts of shady characters come in. So if we're not home, right, if we're not in our root chakra, if we're not in our chakra system, then it's like living in this incredible castle that you leave unlocked and the doors open. And after a while, right, people that are beings that, that walk by or that see this amazing space that's never occupied, the doors always open, it smells amazing, it looks amazing, it's shining, it's beautiful, it's the human body, right? But after a while, it's like, if you are never home, your, your home becomes kind of a squatter's paradise, right? So that's something to understand. If we are not home, if we are not in our home, in our temple, if we are checked out, numbed out, so watch, you know, watch in your personal life where you are tempted to be, to slide out of awareness, right? Out of the body, to numb out, to check out. And this is not to say, you know, to be intensely alert every second of your life, although that is possible but rather to just notice, like notice when you slip out and try not to numb out or slip out of awareness for very long, right? As soon as you catch it, you know, kind of maybe shake it off. I've often described um, trickster energy as feeling like the literal feeling of slipping into an inert or sleepy or hazy feeling because if, right, on the relative level of reality, 
it's not that there's a, a battle between the light and dark, although you could frame it that way, but in our personality, right, when we set intentions, when we decide to make a change, all of the resistance that has been running on its habitual programming tries to unseat us from our intentions, right? So you could call that a battle between light and dark. And in my experience, right, there is, you know, everything is internal resistance, but there's also a kind of resistance that does feel more outer, although there is technically no outer. Um, but when you have inner resistance, you attract, you know, people um, into your life that, uh, that reflect that resistance. So if you have an inner critic whose thoughts you believe, if you have an inner doubter whose thoughts you believe, you know, your family might doubt you. The whole world might doubt you. When you, when you truly come to a place of self-acceptance, the outer reflections tend to really dissipate in my experience at least so so if we think about that emotional scale that scale of energy um another invitation for dark energy you could say could be and this is not something that's very well understood it's something that i've had to learn the hard way but it could be naivety it could be um, a sense of like idiot compassion, right? Which is compassion without wisdom. It's, it's love without discernment. So if you're in love with all beings and you, you know, this can take a spiritual flavor when you have unconditional love for all beings, but you fail to exercise the discernment that you have in the moment to let you know that maybe you shouldn't choose to be in their energy right now. Maybe you shouldn't choose to have them in your life right now because of the way that they are showing up right now. And so when you have, you know, there's this story in psychology of, you know, narcissists attracting empaths. And of course, that makes sense, especially empaths that are stuck in idiot compassion because they are stuck in a naivete. And just like in the same way that a naive person attracts human beings that that mistreat them in the business world and in the material world, right, we also attract non-physical beings of a similar character if we are embodying an energy of naivete. So this is just an interesting thing to understand, right? Everything that happens in the physical world is a, is a physical expression, is the physical principle of something happening on a, on a more subtle level, right? So if you are always taken advantage of if you are always taken advantage of in the physical world, you are embodying a victim mentality. You are you are embodying the, the idea that you can be attacked. You are most likely embodying a form of naivete and, and perhaps you have put your discernment in your shadow. So it's time to bring it out of the shadow to acknowledge the way something feels and to act accordingly, right? When we see reality for what it is, which in the most fundamental sense, everything is love, but in this relative world that we do live in, if you acknowledge the level of energy that you are interacting with and simply and lovingly decide to act appropriately, right? So we don't engage with uh, people that are in, you know, actively being deceptive or trying to harm. Okay, then we just, we just walk the other way. We just choose not to have that in our life. We are free. And when if we don't believe we are free, we can often go into uh, trickster archetypal roles of trying to save, trying to fix, right? The savior, the martyr, which are dark energies as well. And, and embodying those archetypes, right? Sacrificing myself or trying to save someone I've, I've said many times, it is impossible to save someone, right? You can only save yourself, so to speak, and you can only respond when somebody requests your help sincerely. But if you are in an archetype, an identity of the savior, then what you are, that is stemming from an idea that you are not free. So you can, you don't feel free to simply choose to disengage with said energy, whether it's a partner, a family member, a friend, right? You don't feel free. And so the, the only sense of power that you can achieve is to try to change it and fix it. But the very fact that you are remaining affixed to the energy stemming from the belief that you are not free invites all kinds of 
all kinds of um, energy on that level of mind that you are in. So if you feel like a prisoner, you can attract beings that make you feel more imprisoned. In fact, I have a friend who, ever since I have known him, since we were a teenager, um, I would notice that certain energy, it's not an attachment, which by the way, I'll pause and say that it's actually quite rare that somebody has an actual attachment that is living on the person at all times for the simple fact that it's very rare that a person is 100% unconscious. It's very rare, actually. I think the word attachment and entity, I think those those terms are thrown around loosely without much understanding. So I have a friend who ever since he was a child, he I would I would notice that I would be in conversation with him and all of a sudden I've I've been aware of energy and I've had more of my awareness in the energetic world than I realized since I was for, for my whole life. And I would notice that there would be a dark energy that would come in like like Death Eaters from Harry Potter, literally. Um, and they would only come in sometimes and they would only come in when we were discussing certain topics. And uh, after some further investigation as to what was going on with this person, they have a belief that they are a prisoner. And they essentially, it stems from the belief that they are not free and that they, they are imprisoned by the darkness. Right, So the belief, I am a prisoner, I am not free, I am a slave to the system, to my family, to my dark side, that belief would attract an energy that would reflect the same belief. Oh, I believe I'm a prisoner, I will, I will attract patroller beings, and so on and so on. So <clears throat> the desire for power, the refusal to occupy oneself, to be present, Right, which being present, some people say you're always present, you can't not be here. Yes, in a way that's true, but there's a difference between slipping into an unconscious, inert, dreamy, um, uh, numbed out energy, right? There's a difference between that and having more of your bandwidth available to you in, into the moment that you're in and the contents of the moment that you are in. So naivete, uh, not occupying the body, the desire for power. Also to understand, and I, I believe I did another uh, talk about this, but the very fact that you are tuning into something. So how can something like nostalgia or the refusal to let something go, maybe some something traumatic happened in your life, you know, maybe a death, a divorce, a loss, there is of course a natural grieving process, but if your mind tends to go back and back and back and back and replay it, and it's a form of torture, first of all. So of course, think about it. If you're embodying a masochist, think about what kind of energies you would attract. You would attract sadistic energies. And, and there are a lot of beings that feed on the energy of addiction, right? Which is fueled by guilt and shame, refusal to to forgive myself, which is the refusal to see life as it truly is, which is that we are really truly always doing the best that we can. Um, and, and life is constantly evolving itself into new experiences, but we don't allow it to simply be that way often because we care about the people in our lives. So we have a hard time letting go of things but let's say the thing that you can't let go of is somebody who was really awful to you. A very unpleasant experience, right? Perhaps the person was abusive. Well, what you tune into, you create a psychic bridge to. So, you know, let's say I have a friend who had a, a client that she really cared about, that she really wanted to help, but she couldn't. He wasn't ready to be helped, the desire to be free of what he was experiencing wasn't strong enough. Um, and so he actually became dangerous and he would threaten her life and, and stuff like that. And she would continuously tune into him, tune into him, how is he doing, how is he doing, how is he doing? And she would notice, right, and I talked to her about this, 
when you tune into something, you are literally like consciousness is not local. We are not this body. Whatever you tune into, you become vibrationally. And so if you tune into that client that's dangerous or that ex-husband that hit you, or you know that person that's currently working with dark energy, meaning they are, um, they maybe are on a power trip, or maybe they are very deep in an addictive behavior that they cannot see their way out of. If you tune into them, <laughs> if you entangle your energy with them through thought and feeling you invite into your mind anything going on with that person, right? So if a person, let's say, does have entities, your belief that you are powerless, right? The, the belief that we are powerless often makes us actually hyper vigilant and hyper concerned about people in our life. So we think about them, we, th we think about how they're doing, we worry about them not answering us. This, this belief in feeling powerless cause us, causes us to become hypervigilant to things that are not good for us. And that hypervigilance, that hyperfocus is powerful and it creates a psychic bridge that invites whatever is going on on the other side of that channel into your mind because your mind becomes whatever you tune into. So... The bottom line here is a few things. Watch for naivety, right? That's, uh, it's sometimes naivety is so, sometimes any quality is so natural to us that we don't see that we're doing it. And, and having in your awareness this idea of idiot compassion, of having compassion without discernment, that does indeed invite trickster energy into your life. I told this story about myself over the summer. Um, I was in, um, a French colony of, of, Africa, of Africa called Reunion Island uh, with my friend's daughter. We were, that day I was with my friend's daughter and we went into a Hindu temple because on this island is every religion, like so many races, so many religions, so many, it's a really a melting pot of culture. And I had never been to a, a Hindu temple before. And so the hostess invited us to check it out. And not one cell of my body wanted to go that day. I was tired, I was dizzy, I didn't want to deal with it. But the people pleaser in me, which is another thing that would invite things that you don't want into your life. If you do things you don't want, if you go against self, you invite things that you don't want. If I go against myself, I'm going against God. God is in me saying, okay, now, what feels like the right thing to do is to rest, to go home. Then the hostess invites you to do something. Oh, now the people pleaser in me can't make her, can't upset her. So we're going to go do what she wants to do, right? So that could invite, going against yourself could invite dark energy into your life. So I, I said yes. And the second we stepped through the doorway, my friend's daughter who's 15 years old said, oh, I'm not going in there because she hasn't lost her connection as much as I have in my life. And she said, I'm not going in there. She said, I don't care. I'll just wait for you at the door. And I was like, wow, good for you. And so I stepped in, took my shoes off, which I didn't want to do either because the floor was very dirty. And I walk in and I encounter several energies that are quite unsavory, including the groundskeepers. And Long story short, I leave that property with an entity, like a little, you know, some things are not, some some attachments are kind of like fleas or like little bugs that you would pick up, you know, like walking in the woods. They're more like a nuisance, but I felt it like, it was like interfering with my respiratory system and I, I know how to get it off. So I took it off, but I, I reflected and I said, oh my God, what invited that into my experience was not listening to myself, going against myself, which my daughter's friend, she, she listened to herself. She didn't care about being a people pleaser. She said, I am not stepping foot in that place. Boom. So what's the bottom line here? Don't go against yourself. 
uh, self-deception is one of the biggest uh, inviters of entities and and unwanted energy in your life and problems and complexity. Um, not listening to ourselves creates problems in our lives on every dimension, right? The idea that we have to please someone else when it feels awful to us is a fiction. It is a fiction and it has consequences. And I'm here to report to you what those consequences are on different levels of reality. So don't go against yourself. Try to stay in your body, right? Meaning, and not necessarily, right? If you're using your, your imagination and your mind, if you are actually consciously engaging with imagination, that's amazing, right? I don't believe we always have to be in our body necessarily and grounded the way that most people mean it, but I do believe, or I should say I know, that when you're slipping into, you know, like below consciousness, into inert, into numbed out, foggy places, like when, when most people are scrolling through social media, it's not a good place to hang out for very long, right? If you catch yourself there, just don't make any big deal about it and just like laugh. And maybe, you know, spend your time a little more consciously, even if that if it's just like listening to beautiful music and like placing your healing hands on your body. It's better than numbing out on social media, because when you lose awareness and then you're being programmed by whatever you're witnessing, you're intoxicating yourself with garbage. So don't go against yourself. Um, try to stay, you know, try to the best of your ability to be awake to what actually feels nourishing to you and do those things and don't do things that don't feel nourishing to you. Um, understand that on whatever level of emotional energy you are in, any kind of emotional addiction will invite beings of that nature. And simply to understand that without fear, and say, okay, so all I have to do is, right, a big, a big uh, antidote to all of this is to simply infuse more joy into the mundane parts of our lives, right? Because if we leave all of our joy to peak experiences and to, you know, again, a lot of people get a lot of dopamine from looking at social media or from getting feedback from the, in from the social medias and stuff. If we are waiting for that amount of hormone to be secreted in our body in order to feel joy, it's going to feel more and more difficult for us to actually be in our natural state of joy for the other parts of our day. So, so the most, the, the, biggest thing you can do for yourself and your happiness and your freedom is to be more intentional. Be, live in prayer. Get up and, and whether you have a meditation practice in the morning or not, like light a candle for yourself and for the world and for the souls and wish for the happiness of all beings. Ask your soul to use you today and, and listen. Listen to those promptings and act on them. Care about your home, clean your home, C fold your clothes nicely, you know, wear clothing that makes you feel good, put scents on yourself that make you feel good, make more choices, right? We, when we're not making choices, what is making choices is our conditioning and our unconsciousness. So the more awake we are, the more we exercise our free will, the more choices we make, Right, the more um, kind of immune we become to all of those energies that are simply teaching us to come back to ourselves. So there's no fear at all. I can tell you, you know, and I've told a few stories, I've encountered some pretty intense <laughs> stuff in the astral world. But first of all, we survive everything for all of eternity. Everything we've ever been deeply afraid of, everything, you know, everything we've ever lived, we have survived because we are eternal. And fear is actually something that you can learn to, to experience consciously. And sometimes, right, sometimes when we experience an entity or a dark energy, it might be asking us to cultivate a quality. So if we're self-deceiving all the time, 
ask that, ask your higher self, like, what is this teacher trying to teach me? Well, it's trying to teach me to stop deceiving. It's trying to teach me to be in, awaken my body more, to be more aware of my desires, to honor those desires more. Sometimes it's asking me to cultivate courage, you know, courage, feistiness sometimes, right? Sometimes you are in a level of energy in your life where you are actually being called to be courageous, right? Um, maybe you have had a medical diagnosis for 10 years. I know I just, I, I just had my blood work done and I had, when I got that email from Quest Lab, my body went into a, a like a panicked mode, but I experienced it consciously. And I, I said, you know what? I don't, I can be okay anyway. Like whatever this result says, whatever, whatever it is, I can be okay anyway, which is a kind of courage, right? And ultimately you cultivate courage, you cultivate courage and then it becomes, you transcend it uh, because you become simply aware and alive to all the sensations, right? In your, in your life without running from them or, or necessarily preferring them. You're just alive to right now. And so you don't really need courage when you're no longer afraid of fear. <laughs> um, and by the way, it was interesting in my blood works, nothing bad came back except something unusual, which was that I was, <laughs> um, I have too much iron in my blood, which is ironic because I don't eat, I haven't eaten meat since I was 11 years old, but I actually do eat too much spirulina and spinach and that that behavior comes from an energy of distrust of life right which is yet another thing we can look at right when we when we ask ourselves what could invite troubles or complexities into our life the biggest thing is not trusting life if i don't trust life i have to overcompensate and put like half a cup of spirulina <laughs> in my smoothie um and it's just funny, right? I'm always learning. I'm always, it's always so ironic um, that I have too much iron in my blood, which is something usually reserved for, for carnivores because, right? Because I'm not trusting the natural ability of my body to regulate itself, right? I still have taken it upon my small self in some way to compensate for the lack of trust that I have in the universe and in my body. And so I've really begun to anchor that vibration of trust, right? I, now my morning meditation is marinating in the sensation of trust because as many mystical experiences of, as I've had, as much as I know what I am, right? The truth is that there are parts of my mind which I don't disidentify from my mind. I. I raise the vibration of my mind so that all of the dimensions of myself are in alignment. And so if I'm honest with myself, which is yet another thing that can invite trouble is when we are not honest with self, when we're trying to be spiritual, when we're trying to be happy, right? That's something that can invite complexity. If you're being fake, you'll, you'll invite people that are fake with you, that deceive you. So, I'm honest with myself and I see, okay, parts of my mind don't trust. So how can I be so kind and what is the most nourishing, kind and loving thing I can do to bring more love into my life right now? I can marinate on the feeling of trust and anchor it in my root chakra. And that is my current meditation because it was just revealed to me how a part of my mind really feels and that's okay. And so I work with it consciously. So long story short, I hope this, <laughs> answered some questions about dark energy and spirit attachments. It's nothing to be afraid of. Just ask what it's trying to teach you. What quality is it trying to cultivate in you? Um, it has nothing of in the astral world. Nothing has any power. Nothing in the physical world has any power over you. You created it all to teach you how to come back into alignment with your natural state, which is love and trust and abundance and and the miraculous mystical reality of what is right without the distortions of, of fear so i hope this answered some questions and i hope you have a beautiful day